Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. I would ask our in-house guests if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And, of course, our Internet viewers are always reminded you can send questions or comments to us at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. We are pleased today to be co-hosting this special lecture with the Jesse Helms Center. Following our remar the remarks of the ambassador today, Robert Wilkie, who is a member of the Helms Center Board of Directors, will moderate our question and answer session. He will also conclude the program. Mr. Wilkie is a former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Legislative Affairs in the George W. Bush administration. He previously served as a Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and a Senior Director of the National Security Council under both sec a Senior Advisor Condoleezza Rice as well as Stephen Hadley. His professional career began on Capitol Hill, of course, as counsel to Senator Jesse Helms. Legislative Director then for Representative David Funderburg, as well as Counsel and Advisor on International Security Affairs to Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott. And again, Mr. Wilkie will host our concluding remarks. Opening our program and welcoming our special guest is the President of the Heritage Foundation, our good friend, Senator Jim DeMint. Senator? Thank you, John, and thank all of you for being here at our annual Helms Lecture. We're really honored. Uh, our relationship with Israel, the embassy here, to have the ambassador here today. The Jesse Helms Lecture Series highlights foreign policies that the late, great Senator Helms championed throughout his years in office, especially the need for a strong national defense and a decisive role for America in a dangerous world. Today's speaker was born and spent his formative years in the United States, but he returned to his mother's homeland of Israel in 1996 and has been active in their politics and government ever since. His deep ties to both countries have given him a unique perspective on the shared challenges that our nations face. And since 2013, he has worked as Israel's ambassador to the United States and he is ensuring that uh, the challenges that both nations face are well met. As Jesse Helms wrote in his memoirs, there are many reasons why the United States should be a good friend to Israel, but none more important than the right of Israeli citizens to live with freedom from fear of their neighbors. Indeed, this is a right the innocent citizens of every country should enjoy. I also wanted to mention that Ambassador Dermer is probably very familiar with our annual index of economic freedom from his background in trade and investment. For over two de decades, the index has measured the economic opportunity and government barriers to prosperity experienced by people across the globe. It is used as a benchmark for many world leaders to bring reform and opportunity to their countries. In our latest index, Israel had the 10th greatest improvement in their score of all the nations that we, we measure. So congratulations are definitely in order uh, to your home country, Ambassador. Today is also the 67th anniversary of Israel's independence. So happy Independence Day to you and your countrymen. I hope that both of our nations become freer and increase in prosperity in the years to come. But this prosperity, of course, follows upon the safety of our citizens and foiling the plans of those who want to take our freedoms away. These threats seem to be ever-present, and therefore, so must our vigilance. This vigilance is best maintained by a strong relationship between our two countries. Today, I hope to gain some insight into that relationship and its future. So please join me in welcoming our Helms Lecturer for 2015, Ambassador Ronald Dermer. Thank you. 
you know, that index that you spoke about, actually, I can guarantee you that that was on the Prime Minister's desk when it came out, because he would ask me year after year where we stood, and he was before Prime Minister, you know, he spent a couple years as Finance Minister pushing Israel's markets, making them much freer and liberalizing them. He's done that as Prime Minister and as Finance Minister, so I think maybe of all the indices that he follows around the world, that may be at the top of the list. So it's, we're very pleased to see that we've uh, jumped up. I want to thank uh, Senator DeMint for that introduction and for uh, the support that you uh, gave Israel in all your years of uh, public service. So thank you for that. And I also want to thank the Heritage Foundation uh, for this invitation. Isaiah Berlin, where's Niall? Is he, here's Gardner, is he, yes. So Isaiah Berlin, we were talking about both studying in Oxford, Isaiah Berlin, the great British philosopher and historian, once said that an intellectual is someone who wants ideas to be as interesting as possible. Well, if that's the definition of an intellectual, then the Heritage Foundation is definitely a think tank uh, for intellectuals. You make policy ideas very interesting. And as someone who has read quite a few of those uh, position papers over the years uh, that were put out by this august institution, it's a real honor for me to be here tonight to deliver this, today to deliver this uh, annual lecture. In his first two terms in the US Senate, Senator Helms was widely perceived to be unfriendly uh, toward Israel. No doubt his opposition in principle to all foreign aid uh, was part of that perception. But during his final three terms, Senator Helms became one of Israel's staunchest advocates and boldest defenders. He opposed attempts by both Republican and Democratic administrations alike to pressure Israel, especially when it came to matters of Israel's national security. He stood unequivocally against Palestinian terrorism even when a misguided conventional wisdom led many others to look the other way. He worked tirelessly to protect Israel from the automatic anti-Israel majorities at the United Nations, and legislation he spearheaded two decades ago still has, is still making a difference today. And Senator Helms also became a great champion of the U.S.-Israel alliance. When he was asked in March 1995, in an interview, whether there was a new basis for a post-Cold War strategic relationship between the United States and Israel, this was his reply. Israel is surrounded by terrorists who threaten not only Israel, but the United States and its allies in Europe and the Middle East. The United States has vital strategic interests in the Middle East, and it is imperative that we have a reliable ally whom we can trust, one who shares our goals and values. Israel is the only state in the Middle East that fits that bill. Those words ring as true today as they did 20 years ago, and I appreciate the opportunity to expand on them here in speaking about the U.S.-Israel relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, every person who has the privilege to serve as Israel's ambassador to the United States develops a special appreciation for the unique alliance between America and Israel. In this post, you get reminded every day of the depth uh, and breadth of that relationship in security and intelligence, in diplomacy, in trade, in science, in technology, in art, in culture, and in so many other areas. But for me, an appreciation for America, for Israel, and for the unique bond between us began at home, literally. As Senator DeMint said, my father was born and raised uh, in America, and my mother was born and raised in pre-state Israel. Uh, and ever since I can remember, they instilled in me a love and admiration for both countries. I feel truly blessed to have been raised in America. I was educated by the wisdom of America's founders. I was inspired by the words of America's leaders and protected by the sacrifices of America's soldiers. And when I think of freedom, I think of Lincoln. When I think of courage, I think of Normandy. And when I think of justice, I think of Martin Luther King, Jr. And as a Jew, I also have a deep appreciation for what America has meant to the Jewish people. Now, for the Jewish people, I can sum up the greatness of America in less than a sentence, in less than a word, in less than a letter. It's a hyphen. It's the hyphen in the middle of the phrase Jewish American. Now, throughout our history, Jews, if we were lucky, we faced a choice. 
we could keep our Jewish identities and be shut out of the larger society, or we could abandon our Jewish identity and become full members of those societies. But in America, Jews didn't have to make that choice. We could stay true to our faith and traditions, and we could be fully American, just like Irish Americans and Italian Americans and any other American. And as I got older, I also grew to appreciate the profound importance of the rebirth of the Jewish state, the importance of the Jewish people having the capability to defend themselves, having the importance of having a place of refuge, the importance of having a sovereign jo uh, voice among the nations. And the more I understood the unique nature of both America and Israel, the more I understood the unique nature of the alliance between our two countries. America and Israel are two promised lands founded on the same ideals, upholding the same values, fighting the same enemies, and sharing the same destiny. America has long been, as Lincoln once said, the last best hope on earth, carrying the torch of freedom for all humanity and entrusted by history with securing liberty's future. Israel is the hope of the Jewish people, holding the torch of freedom high in the darkest region on earth and entrusted by history with securing the Jewish future. In much of the discussion over the U.S.-Israel alliance, this fundamental bond is too often forgotten. Instead, the focus is mainly on the policies of our two governments. The health of the U.S.-Israel alliance is often judged on the basis of what our two, if, whether our two governments see eye to eye on Iran, on the peace process, on whatever the issue is of the day. And those are certainly important questions. And when the policies are two, of our two governments are aligned, there is definitely less turbulence in the U.S.-Israel relationship. But policy differences between our two governments have never been decisive in determining the trajectory of the overall U.S.-Israel relationship. That trajectory has been far more affected by our enduring values and by changing perceptions of Israel's strategic importance. 67 years ago today, on May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared Israel's independence. It took all of 11 minutes for President Harry Truman to recognize the state of Israel. Now, some may think that that recognition began the strategic alliance between America and Israel, but it didn't. Truman's decision was a historic act of moral clarity, but it came at a time when there was an American arms embargo on a fledgling Jewish state that was fighting for its life against five invading Arab armies. Israel's War of Independence in 1948 was fought with Czech rifles. And two decades later, Israel flew French planes in the Six-Day War. What forged the strategic alliance between our two countries was Israel's prowess and resilience on the battlefield, as well as a growing appreciation by American policymakers that Israel was not merely a moral cause, but also a strategic asset. What started for some as a moral imperative to help the Jewish people overcome the horrors of the past became an effort by many to strengthen a reliable ally that could help America address both present and future challenges in the Middle East. And that was true for the second half of the Cold War, and that has been true since the rise of militant Islam as a force in our region. Now, American and Israelis have always understood that we stand on the same side of the moral divide. That has never changed. But it took two decades before the benefits of a strategic alliance with Israel became clear to US policymakers. And in recent years, particularly since 9-11, the benefits of that, of that alliance have become clearer to all but the most willfully blind. Now, ladies and gentlemen, What America means to Israel is obvious to everyone. It's good to have the world superpower on your side. America has helped Israel shoulder its enormous defense burden with generous, very generous military assistance, fund and develop 
the world's, one of the world's finest missile defense systems, maintain Israel's qualitative military edge, and ensure that Israel can defend itself by itself against any threat. And alongside helping Israel meet its considerable defense needs, America has also extended critical diplomatic and economic support to Israel by vetoing anti-Israel resolutions at the UN Security Council, signing America's first ever trade agreement uh, with a foreign country, that was Israel, and by providing critical loan guarantees to Israel in times of need. Now the truth is, if I were to list everything that America did for Israel, I wouldn't have any time to discuss anything else. Suffice it to say that America has been and remains Israel's indispensable ally. But Israel has also been an invaluable ally of the United States. To understand what Israel means to America, I suppose I could discuss the Israeli technology and know-how that improves American lives, the Israeli science and medicine that prolongs American lives, or the Israeli intelligence and security cooperation that saves American lives. But a better way to appreciate what Israel means to America is to simply imagine a Middle East without Israel. Imagine not having an anchor of democracy in the region, not having an island of unabashed pro-American sentiment, not having an ally with soldiers as competent and, as, and as courageous as your own in defending your values and interests. Now imagine a Middle East with three Israels. Imagine two more countries that share American interests and values in the unstable swath of territory that stretches from the Straits of Gibraltar to the Khyber Pass. What a profound difference that would mean for America. What a profound difference that would mean for the peace and security of the Middle East and the world. As the alliance between America and Israel has grown from a moral commitment to a strategic partnership, it has weathered many serious disagreements, even on vital issues. In 1948, then Secretary of State George Marshall warned the soon-to-be Israeli government not to declare its independence. In 1967, as Nasser was tightening the noose around Israel's ne neck on the eve of the Six-Day War, President Johnson made clear to Israel that if it acted alone, it would be alone. In 1981, after Israel bombed the Osirak reactor, nuclear reactor, the Reagan administration joined in condemning Israel and the UN Security Council and held up arms transfers to Israel for three months. In 2002, after Israel responded to the worst terror campaign against it in its history, by launching Operation Defensive Shield to dismantle the Palestinian terror infrastructure that had been built in the West Bank, the Bush administration insisted that within days that Israel withdraw its forces immediately. These are only a few of the many instances where there was serious turbulence in the U.S.-Israel relationship. But despite these bumps, the alliance between America and Israel grew stronger and our friendship grew deeper decade after decade. That the same will happen in the decades to come, despite the serious differences that we have today with the Obama administration over the emerging deal with Iran. A deal which is clearly a foreign policy priority of the president, but which also concerns and touches on the most vital interests of the state of Israel. Iran is a regime that openly and continually calls for the annihilation of Israel. As the Lausanne Framework Agreement was being negotiated, the commander of the besieged forces in Iran declared that the destruction of Israel is non-negotiable. And Iran's repulsive rhetoric is coupled with belligerent action. Iran has established two terror fronts against Israel, in Lebanon through their proxy Hezbollah, and in Gaza, through their support of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, terror bases from which some 20,000 rockets have already been fired, and which now have over 100,000 rockets pointed at Israel. Now Iran is working to establish two more fronts against Israel, on the Syrian Golan and in the West Bank. And it should be obvious to everyone that Iran is not just a problem for Israel. Iran controls four Arab capitals, 
Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut, and Sanaa, and Iran is the foremost sponsor of terrorism in the world. The P5 plus one led by the United States believe that the deal it is currently negotiating with Iran will make the Middle East safer and will make Israel safer. Israel believes this deal will make the Middle East much more dangerous and threaten Israel's survival. The difference between our governments is not one of intentions. I have no doubt that the Obama administration does not want to see Iran get nuclear weapons. I have no doubt that the Obama administration does not want an agreement with Iran that would endanger Israel. Nor do the differences between our governments on the Iran issue stem from a lack of appreciation by Israel for the many things that the Obama administration has done over the last more than six years to strengthen Israel, and it has done many things to strengthen Israel. The difference between us is a difference of judgment of what the consequences of a deal based on the Lusanne framework would be. The Obama administration has argued that the many tens of billions of dollars that will pour into Iran's coffers when sanctions are quickly removed will be used to address Iran's pressing domestic needs. Israel thinks that a large part of this money will fuel Iran's external aggression in the region as it ramps up support for Shia militias in Iraq, for Assad's regime in Syria, for Hezbollah in Lebanon, and for the Houthis in Yemen. The Obama administration believes that this deal will prevent nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. Israel believes that this deal will spur nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. States in our region understand that the restrictions that would be placed by this deal on Iran's nuclear program are only temporary. That is why they are likely to seek nuclear programs of their own. The bottom line is that the Obama administration believes that the deal they are currently negotiating with Iran blocks Iran's path to the bomb. Israel believes that this deal paves Iran's path to the bomb. It paves that path by, legitimating, by legitimizing Iran's illicit nuclear program, by quickly removing the sanctions, and by automatically removing critical restrictions on Iran's nuclear program in a decade. Iran won't have to sneak in or break in to the nuclear club. They will simply walk into the nuclear club. And Israel believes that the alternative to this bad deal is to keep the pressure on, to insist on a far more significant rollback of Iran's vast nuclear infrastructure, and critically, to link the removal of restrictions on Iran's nuclear program to a change in behavior of the Iranian regime. If the optimists are right, and Iran changes for the better over the next decade, then those restrictions can be removed. If the pessimists are right, and Iran continues to threaten Israel, continues its aggression in the region, and continues to sponsor terrorism around the world, then those restrictions should not be removed. As the Prime Minister said in his speech to Congress a couple of months ago, if Iran wants to be treated like a normal country, let it start acting like a normal country. Ladies and gentlemen, the profound disagreement between our two governments on such a vital issue, I am confident that despite those disagreements, that the alliance between America and Israel will continue to grow stronger and stronger in the coming years and decades. First, because deal or no deal, the most dangerous security challenges facing the United States will continue to emanate from the Middle East for a long time to come. I know that some hope that America can pivot away from the Middle East, but for the foreseeable future, I don't think the Middle East is going to oblige those hopes. And Israel's importance to America as a reliable ally, as a formidable military power in a very dangerous region, will become not less critical, but more critical for advancing America's security interests. Second, the 21st century is a century of knowledge in which prosperity in the developed world will be driven primarily by the ability to innovate. Now, there are two great centers of innovation in the world today. One is west of here in a valley in Northern California. 
The other is east of here on Israel's Mediterranean coastline. Now, Israel is a world leader in technology at the cutting edge of many fields in medicine and science and an unrivaled innovator in water, agriculture, cyber, and other areas. Consider this. In the last couple of years, over 10% of global investment in cyber has been in Israel. Now, we are one-tenth of 1% one of the world's population, and we are getting over 10% of global investment. That means that Israel is punching over 100 times its weight. So we are not in cyber. We're not a population of 8 million. We're closer to a population of a billion. In cyber, Israel is a China. And America's leading technology companies, including Intel, Microsoft, Apple, Google, and dozens of others, they have R&D facilities in Israel and compete with each other to gobble up Israeli startups. Now, I have news for you. They are in Israel not because they are Zionists. <laughs> they are in Israel because they want to tap in to Israel's remarkable culture of innovation. They want to position themselves to continue to lead the world in the next century. And so for those two reasons alone, security and technology, I believe Israel is likely to be America's most important ally in the 21st century. Now, that sounds like a strong statement. But if an Israeli ambassador would have stood here 30 years ago and would have said that Israel is going to become a global technological power, that statement would have sounded even more far-fetched. But that happened. And if that ambassador would have also said that one day Israel was going to sell gas to Arab countries, people would have thought that sounded downright crazy. But that's going to happen. Uh, you know, we used to think that Moses was a great leader but a lousy navigator because he took <laughs> us to the, to the one place in the Middle East that doesn't have uh, gas and oil. Now it looks like that Moses wasn't such a bad navigator after all. And Israel's strategic position in the region will be enhanced considerably in the years ahead because of the significant energy resources we have discovered and we may yet discover. But beyond security and technology, my confidence in the strength of the U.S.-Israel alliance also comes from the understanding that our alliance is rooted in something much, much deeper. It is rooted in the common heritage. It's a good word, especially here. <laughs> It is rooted in the common heritage that is the wellspring of our most cherished values. The idea that all are created equal in the image of God, that no one is above the law, that compassion for the most vulnerable is a sacred obligation. Those ideas which have been a moral compass for generations of Americans and American leaders, those ideas were first championed in the land of Israel by the prophets of my people thousands of years ago. These ideas are fused into the national identity of the Jewish people and have been brought powerfully, been brought powerfully to life in the one and only Jewish state. Now, as so much of the Middle East descends into chaos and barbarism, Israel stands out as a beacon of humanity. We are in a region, Israel lives in a region, where women are often treated like chattel, where Christians are beheaded in mass, and where gays are hanged in town squares. In Israel, women are fighter pilots and chief justices. A thriving Christian community grows year after year, and gays proudly march through the streets of Tel Aviv. In a region where justice is never blind, and where equal opportunity for minorities is largely a fiction. An Israeli Arab sends Israel's former president to prison, and an Israeli Muslim graduated first in her class at Israel's most prestigious university. In a region where regimes set up terror bases to murder the innocent and dispatch killers across the world, Israel sets up field hospitals to treat the wounded and dispatches and sends doctors to save lives from Nepal to Haiti. Ladies and gentlemen, while I'm confident that our shared interests, which I spoke about, will bring America and Israel closer together 
in the years ahead. It is our shared values that will ensure that America and Israel are never pulled apart. Ultimately, those enduring values will not be trumped by differences over the best way to stop a nuclear Iran or the best way to advance peace in the Middle East. Nor can these values be buried under cynical attempts to focus on every blemish of our imperfect societies to drive a wedge between us. Eventually, the gulf that separates both of us from our enemies cannot be ignored. Eventually, the light that unites our two shining cities on a hill inevitably breaks through the darkness. Now, the truth is that Israel and America are two countries whose deepest identities, deepest identity was forged in the same fires and who face the same future. That is why this alliance will weather every storm. That is why the bonds between Israel and America are truly unbreakable. And I am supremely confident that this unbreakable alliance will help both our countries get to safer shores. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, and um, on behalf of the Jesse Helms Center, we want to thank Heritage for continuing to keep alive the memory of one of the great Americans of the 20th century. And I also want to recognize in the audience uh, two people. Uh, Senator Helms' uh, grandson, Mike Stewart, is with us, as well as John Dodd, the president of the Jesse Helms Center. Uh, as a Tar Heel, I've had no higher honor than the time I spent working for Jesse Helms. But I have to tell you, it was a little intimidating. My first day, he called me into his office and he said, son, tell me what a liberal is. And I tried to be erudite and I brought up Lyndon Johnson and I even threw out John Kenneth Galbraith's name. And Senator Helms looked at me and said, no, son, you don't understand a liberal educated beyond capacity. <laughs> but Senator Helms had two abiding faiths. One was to defend the Constitution at home and national sovereignty abroad. And it was Margaret Thatcher, who at the dedication of the Jesse Helms Center, I think put it best, said, Senator Helms' record as a freedom fighter is unmatched and his convictions were triumphantly validated in circumstances so embarrassing to his critics that they have been rewriting history ever since. It was those convictions that led Jesse Helms to build his own covenant with Israel. And it was a journey that started when Senator Helms was a young Senate staffer in the 1940s, when he worked for Senator Willis Smith of North Carolina because there was a door in Senator Helms' office that opened to another office that was occupied by the newly minted senator from California named Richard Nixon. And it was Richard Nixon who often told Senator Helms, or Jesse as he was then, stories about this man, David Ben-Gurion. And it was Nixon who described Ben-Gurion to a young Jesse Helms as the prophet of fire which appealed to Senator Helms' Southern Baptist sensibilities. And it was later in his life that Senator Helms' journey to that covenant reached its apogee. Here was a Baptist deacon from Monroe, North Carolina, dedicating the Hecht Synagogue at Hebrew University on Mount Scopus, and then journeying to Kiryat Shimona, a place that is the embodiment of the resiliency of the human spirit that Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke so eloquently of a few months ago, a place where children and the unarmed had experienced the savagery of genocidal terrorism firsthand. And the children of Kiryat Shimona gave Senator Helms what, what would become his signature item. 
they handed him a massive stamp that had no on it. And behind the stamp was a little bronze, bronze marker that said to Senator Helms, Senator No, who always says yes to Israel. And that stamp can still be seen today at the Helms Center. So I want to finish my part of this by uh, mentioning the remarks Senator Helms gave on that day at Kiryat Shimona. He said, I believe peace in the Middle East must be the cornerstone of American foreign policy. This conflict has for too long been an excuse for the Arab world to avoid democratization, economic liberalization, and political and civil rights. All the people of the Middle East deserve to live within safe and secure borders. However, I will never support a peace between Israel and any of its neighbors that is not a real peace made without inducements or threats, a peace that is made under the thumb of any third party cannot be genuine or lasting. And I will now um, start off and use the speaker's privilege to ask the ambassador the first question and then we'll open it up to the audience and ask that you identify yourselves. Uh, when I was working for Condi Rice, I think the last letter I received from Senator Helms in 2003 was a handwritten letter on the subject of Iran. And like all Southerners, Senator Helms sort of starts and ends with Thomas Jefferson as his lodestar. And he said, Robert, in 1805, in a letter from Jefferson to Madison, the great Thomas argued, quote, the efficacy of an embargo cannot be denied. Indeed, if a commercial weapon can be properly crafted for the executive hand, it is more and more apparent to me that it can force nations to respect the rights of man. Jefferson, for his part, contended that in foreign affairs, quote, there are three alternatives and only three to be chosen from, embargo, war, submission, and tribute, unquote. Robert Jefferson raises a great point. There are, in fact, only three tools in foreign policy, diplomacy, sanctions, and war. Take away sanctions and what would our options be when dealing with terrorists and genocidal maniacs? Empty talk or sending in the Marines. Please make sure that the White House takes a close look at what is happening in Iran. And that was in 2003. So, Mr. Ambassador, I'll just ask you from the, uh, the past of Jesse Helms, a comment about not only his remarks, but Thomas Jefferson's. First of all, he knew how to write a letter. That's my, my, my first comment. Um, I don't think um, that the choices, as is sometimes said, are between the alternative that is currently on the table and war. Israel does not believe that. It's important also to understand, first and foremost, that uh, Israel has the most uh, to lose by a nuclear-armed Iran. Uh, so we have every reason to want to see a deal that would actually prevent Iran from getting the bomb. The reason why we oppose it is, as I said, we think it paves the path to the bomb. Number two, Israel has the most to lose by a military confrontation with Iran. People forget that. Whether that confrontation would be led by the United States or others, the ones who are most vulnerable to the attack of Iran and its proxies are the Israeli public. Right now, Iranian ICBMs don't reach New York and Washington. I don't know what it will be uh, in a few years, particularly this deal doesn't cover ICBMs. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, only in cartoons do you put TNT on ICBMs. In the real world, uh, ICBMs carry nuclear payloads. They're called intercontinental ballistic missiles. Israel's on the same continent as Iran. Those ICBMs are not for Israel, they're for you, and Iran is continuing to develop them. But I think it's very important to understand that Israel doesn't want a nuclear-armed Iran, and Israel believes that the best outcome for Israel is a diplomatic resolution to this problem. Israel has the most to gain from it. You know, a lot of people have spoken about 
the comparisons between this agreement and what happened with North Korea 20 years ago, particularly in a lot of statements that were made at the time that it was going to bring North Korea into the community of nations, that it was going to stop nuclear proliferation on the Korean Peninsula. It's actually worth it to go back and read the public statements that were made at the time. But few people point to a basic moral difference between those talks and these talks. And the moral difference is that, is this. Then you had six party talks with North Korea. Two of those parties were the South Koreans and the Japanese. The ones who were most effective, affected and most vulnerable to the agreement that would be made. So it's hard right now to criticize either President Clinton or President Bush for not doing what the South Koreans and the Japanese were asking them not to do. In this case, the P5 plus 1 in those negotiations, Israel is not there and the Arab states are not there. And Israel and the Arabs have a very similar view of the deal that is emerging right now with Iran. And I'm sure they're hearing about it in other places in, uh, in this general area over the, over the next couple days. So we're not there. We're not at the table, which is one of the reasons why it was so important for the prime minister to come and speak. Because if we don't have a vote, then at least let's have a voice. Let's be able to express exactly what our view is and exactly what we think about this agreement. We do not believe that the choice is war or to accept this deal. We believe the way you peacefully will resolve this issue is to combine a credible military threat of force with crippling sanctions. That's the combination that will work. That combination has not been deployed for 10 years, as is sometimes argued. You have not had crippling sanctions on Iran for 10 years. You've had sanctions on Iran for a long time. But crippling sanctions actually only began in 2012. And within 18 months, Iran came to the negotiating table desperate to see those sanctions removed. And the hope at the time was that you would dismantle the sanctions regime when Iran would dismantle its nuclear program. And instead, what this deal does is it dismantles the sanctions regime and leaves Iran with its nuclear program essentially intact, an advanced nuclear program today, albeit with constraints, but within about a decade, those restraints are removed, and Iran will have an industrial nuclear program tomorrow. That's not a very good deal. The alternative to this and the, I guess, the Helmsian uh, uh, three-part choice is to hold firm, to ratchet up uh, pressure, uh, and to not assume that what Iran won't agree to today, they won't agree to tomorrow. Remember, if we were having this discussion, if I were here two years ago, and I would have told you that you could force, with the right mix of pressure, military, a credible military threat and other pressures, you could force Assad of Syria to basically give up those chemical weapons stockpiles and, and, and remove virtually all of the capacity that he had to make chemical weapons, not all, but virtually all of that, you would have said to me that that's totally unrealistic. That will not happen. And you would have been right at the time that that was totally unrealistic. May 14th, 2013, that was totally unrealistic. But by September, that became very realistic. So don't assume that just because Iran won't agree to today to what I've argued for, that it won't necessarily agree to that deal tomorrow under much greater pressure. Maury Amitay, I'm a former executive director of APAC. Would you care to comment on the support uh, for stronger action against Iran from some of your neighbors, notably Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and even perhaps Egypt? I think WikiLeaks have done some reports on what Israel's neighbors um, think uh, about Iran. You know, when, when Israelis and Arabs are on the same page, people should pay attention. <laughs> that's what we call the ultimate no-spin zone, no pun intended. Um, they're deeply concerned. They're deeply concerned, it's true, about Iran's nuclear program, about Iran's march through the region because they see what's happening. They see that Iran is gobbling up countries in the Middle East. And they say, if Iran is doing this today, 
when it doesn't have a nuclear program. Imagine what it will do tomorrow if it does have a nuclear program. Um, and they're, they're very, uh, very concerned. And I don't blame them for being concerned because Iran is, just, is a threat to them as well and undermines and destabilizes their regimes as well. Um, and I think this is a unique moment in the history of the Middle East where really the world as, as the Israelis see it in terms of our interests and the world as the Arabs see it in terms of their immediate and most pressing and urgent interests are lined up. And I think that not only should we stand together in confronting common threats, I think we should do whatever we can to try to seize the opportunity of an aligning of interests to see if you can't begin a broader rapprochement between Israel and the Arab world. You know, they used to believe that the key to that was solving the Palestinian uh, question. And there's no doubt that that issue cannot be ignored in any broader uh, peace between Israel and the Arab world. But as the Prime Minister said uh, a few months ago, I'm not so sure that the reverse won't be true, he said, meaning that I don't know if Israeli-Palestinian peace will unlock a broader rapprochement with the Arab world. It might be that the broader rapprochement with the Arab world will unlock Israeli-Palestinian uh, Israeli peace. And I think we should be focusing uh, in the next few years and seeing how we can uh, take advantage of this historic aligning uh, of interest between Israel and our Arab neighbors. As an American um, who's older than Israel, um, I, my, your speech was fabulous, but my enormous sorrow and fear is I have watched a lot of policy differences between the United States and Israel. This feels different. This feels like the moral divide has broken, that for the first time we have an administration that is morally on the other side. I feel that as an American, and many other Americans feel it. Do average Israelis see it that way? I mean, in, in a certain sense, you're much more optimistic than I. I hope you can tell me Israelis don't see it the way Americans see it. Well, look, I, I, don't, I don't agree that the administration is on the other side of the moral divide. I do think they have a different view on how to advance common uh, objectives. And as I said here, I don't think they want to see a nuclear-armed Iran. I don't think they want to do, uh, make an agreement that they think will endanger uh, uh, Israel or make the region less secure. I don't believe that. Uh, and I've been in enough meetings with the president uh, uh, to have a great deal of confidence that he's sincere in, on his commitment to try to create a, a better region and a safer and more secure Israel. We just have a disagreement on how that's going to be achieved. So I don't think we're on different sides of the moral divide. And, and look, I, I never forget, as Israel's ambassador, when people say to me, well, you must have a very difficult job. You have a lot of challenges and everything. I never forget that my grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents, going back 100 generations, would have given anything to trade their problems with mine. Israel is a very strong country uh, with a very strong economy um, and a very resilient public. Very resilient people. You know, we didn't come back from 2,000 years of exile in the four corners of the earth to see a bunch of fanatic ayatollahs cut the thread of Jewish history. That's not going to happen. But we have to stay very strong, and we have to recognize that because Israel is a very small country, we can go from great strength to great vulnerability like that. And I think a lot of people don't understand that because the image they have of Israel, especially for the last few decades, is only one of strength and of power. But if Israel makes mistakes, it can go and become very vulnerable very quickly, and we cannot afford to make those mistakes. We don't have margins for error. You know, everyone says uh, the key to peace is mutually agreed land swaps. I say mutually agreed neighbor swaps, all right? So we take Canada and we give you Syria, and then uh, we'll, take, uh, we'll take Mexico, and you can take anybody you want in the region. Uh, America was blessed with Canada and Mexico and fish as neighbors. Uh, Israel's in a much more dangerous neighborhood. We are much closer, much more vulnerable to the threats. And there are differences of view between a president who is leading the United States thousands of miles away from these issues in a country that's 500 times the size of Israel um, than the prime minister of Israel, who's in a very tiny country much closer, much more vulnerable, 
and who cannot roll the dice with the future of the one and only Jewish state. Mr. Ambassador, we've actually reached, reached the end of the time. But uh, I want to say on behalf of the Helms Center, we can't thank you enough. And I did want to conclude um, with some remarks that Senator Helms gave at Hebrew University that day when he dedicated the synagogue there. He said, it is one of the sad ironies of our time in history that the very land and even the very sites where the one we Baptists call the Prince of Peace spent his time on earth that knows so little respite from disputes and danger. We must do better, no matter how many years it takes, because surely the God of Abraham and all of Abraham's children will give us the wisdom to find a way. So on that note, we can't thank you enough for honoring us today and uh, wish, you, wish you much luck. And for those of you in the audience, we would remain seated until the ambassador's party departs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.